Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this rather unusual program of bringing two celebrity personalities to speak about something not to do exactly with their profession, but with their great passion, which has helped them in their professional lives, inspired others to emulate their example, and in fact, are experts on the subject almost as much as in their professional lives. I have pleasure in introducing Dr. Farooq Udwadia. He is eminent physician, a great eminent music lover. With me is also Justice Roynton Nariman, who has just retired from the Supreme Court prematurely. Some say the Chief Justice India never had. And a prodigious memory a wonderful speaker on several subjects. He is on YouTube all the time. You can hear him. His love of music and particularly of the late romantic and period with Wagner and Richard Strauss is prolific. And he's a wonderful conversationalist. And what two better people can we have with us than these two great gentlemen? Farooq and Narima, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for participating in this. Thank it was you. a program that we wanted to have for a long time. But let me start by asking both of you, how come that you started this great love of Western classical music in spite of your occupation and why it continues over several decades? My love for music started at home and I'll tell you how. My mother used to play the piano and I must have been about five years old. And every Thursday, which was a holiday, I went to school at, when I was five. Every Thursday and every Sunday, from morning to evening, I would hear her playing the piano. And I would say, why are you playing so long? And she would say that I have to appear for the FTCL examination. So I was introduced to Bach. I was introduced to Mozart. I was introduced to Beethoven and I used to, I was introduced to Litz. And funnily enough, even at that age, because I'm hearing it so often, I could make out when she was playing Bach and I could make out when she was playing the Hungarian Rhapsody. I would mix the others up quite often. That's <laughs> how I got introduced really to music. And then, if I may say, when I was uh, in school, she insisted that I learn music. And I was not very keen on that. Because when we went to school in the bus, we had half an hour to play and she made me play the mandolin of all things. <laughs> and there was this music teacher, Mr. De Cruz. I think his name was Mr. De Cruz. He would be standing for the bus to come and I would jump out the window and run. And he would chase me to the applause of the bigger boys then at that time. He would scruff, catch me by the scruff of my neck and it was mandolin time. I outgrew that. And they gave me the violin. And I must say, I loved the violin. I loved the violin. I think I finished past my eighth grade when I was 16 or 17 years old and then went to medical school and I forgot the violin for quite some time. Very busy with my studies. I took up the violin again later, dropped it again. But then came into my life when I was 50 years old, a grand teacher called Mr. Melbourne Halloway. He was a fantastic teacher and amazingly, I played the violin when I was in my late 50s better than I had played when I was in my teens. And I had an ambition which I fulfilled. The ambition was to play the Beethoven's Violin Concerto by heart. I managed to do that and let it remain by heart for about eight days or so, after which something or the other, I stopped for some time and it disappeared from my memory. But he was a fantastic teacher. 
he was the only one who could say anything to me and he said quite a number of nasty things to me <laughs> and i would keep quiet because it was a student teacher teacher relation but one fine day suddenly comes home in the evening when i just come home and says doctor i want to talk to you i said what is it mr halloween i think i must stop teaching you i said why said, because i thought you would be much better than what you are i said are you out of your mind mr halloween you want me to be a menuhin or a high pitch do you know why i play the violin i play the violin to take the stress of my life away and because i love playing the violin i think he understood me yes. and he carried on his death was a great blow to me because i couldn't find a teacher to teach me and it's difficult to play the violin if there's some somebody good teaching you so i slowly 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 deteriorated i've taken it up again sporadically and i've started with the box a double violin concerto and i love it you never went to jules crain who was a sort of a successor no olga crain's husband the no. belgian violinist no, no no i never went to him in fact my earlier days with a poor old teacher called sebastian was oh yes you yes, know yes he used to come and if i didn't practice he would make me kneel and play the violin <laughs> those were the days yes and then when he was about to go you would ask me have you got some dansak for me <laughs> and i would so we beaten it up <laughs> that's how it was so that's well, my introduction well it's me. a great farsi introduction yes it is rointen how about you ever since i can remember my parents would play gramophone records and they were always classical we used to have that old nord mende gramophone record yeah. player and one of my earliest records that i can recall is the mala forth oh edward van boyne by no with the concert gebar it was a red covered record and strangely enough the very first concert that i was taken to abroad happened to be the mala forth my uncle soli contractor who was very fond of music and took me to the proms and in the royal albert hall we had john pritchard conduct the bbc symphony orchestra and the very first thing i heard was mahler's fourth symphony here is this prodigious memory coming to fore yeah. the other records that i can remember are the great beethoven ninth the 1964 version with klemper and the philharmonia and uh, of course aida with zinka milanov and with this of course one sort of grew into classical music as it were i was of course made to study the piano which was not a very happy experience i won't name my teacher <laughs> but i did fairly well but did not like piano playing as a result unfortunate what i did somehow like very much was the occasional foray into rhythm house ah where we had all our great dum dum pressings as they were in the old days for example the rudolf kemp and berlin philharmonic brahms first the great brahms first piano concerto with uh, george zell and the cleveland and uh, leon fleischer and all these delightful records which we used to drool over and got very very little of because unfortunately my pocket money didn't allow me to purchase these records so as and when i did well in school or i won an elocution competition or something i would take father to the rhythm house and then get a record as as a result later of course we went to the british council library of the third floor and listened to the gramophone society that's records right. of kekashru kama that's right and there was a sort of printed uh, concert program. program yes so you would begin with an overture then you'd have a piano or violin concerto intermission and then the main work subsequent and often you had uh, these little tests you know where they play something and then you have to guess now as a little boy when i knew very little we have this remarkable thing of my having won some third prize once and having got vivaldi's winter from the four seasons oh. as a result and we also have my father nudging me and asking me what was what <laughs> <laughs> he didn't make it <laughs> Well, you know, you spoke about dum dum pressings. Yes. You know, I'm a collector of very old records, the seventy eights, and you know, dum dum pressings are prized by collectors more 
than the pressings made at Hayes or in Germany. Because the quality of the lac that they had in their factory in Dum Dum was better. Wow. Oh, nice. And therefore, a Dum Dum pressing of an early Caruso would fetch more money than a recent press. Delightful. Yes. Doctor spoke about his violin playing, right? Mm. I don't know if he remembers, but he came to Delhi a couple of years back. And we discussed, among other things, the Schumann violin concerto. You remember that, doctor? And thereby hangs a remarkable tale. The Schumann violin concerto was composed when Schumann actually admitted himself into an mm. asylum. It was dedicated to the great Joseph Joachim, mm. as did Brahms. But Joachim, unfortunately, refused to play it in his lifetime. In fact, in his will, he willed it to the Prussian archives with a stipulation that it will be played only a hundred years after Schumann's death, which would have been 1956, the year of my birth, incidentally. Now, before 1956, in the 1930s, his great niece, also a great violinist, Jelly Darani, yes. had a visitation from great uncle Joachim. And the visitation informed her about the Schumann concerto lying in the Prussian archives and the fact that Joachim ought to have played it, but didn't, and exhorted her to take it out of the archives and, and play it for the first time, which she did. Now, unfortunately, at that point, we were in Nazi Germany. This was 1937. Jelly Darani was Jewish. That's true. So, no question of her play. So, it was given to a violinist called Kulan Kampf, who then had performed it with the Berlin Philharmonic with Hans Schmidt Isestet conducting in 1937. It was due to have been played by Menuhin first. Menuhin followed up in 10 days by playing it in Carnegie Hall. But Menuhin had the last laugh because apparently Kulam Kampf played the concerto with huge corrections by Paul Hindemith. Oh. And Menuhin played it for the first time without correction. So, in fact, Menuhin played it for the very first time. And his recording is here in the house. Yes. The 78th. Yes. 1937 yes. recording. So, the Schumann concerto, unfortunately, is not as well known as his other concerto. But it's a very beautiful work. The piano concerto is the best known. The cello concerto, though yes. better known, at least speaking for myself, is a poorer work than the violin concerto. It's a very beautiful concerto. But even with the cello concerto, there hangs another tale. Zubin Mehta, the great conductor, was invited by the Berlin Philharmonic to conduct at the age of 26, which is a record which I am told which is yet unbeaten. Yes. Among the pieces he conducted was the Schumann cello concerto. And he was so nervous that he went on stage without buttoning his fly. And apparently, after the concert, as he was turning around, the concert master looked him and, at him and said, Herr Kapellmeister, der Hosen. He looked down, did the needful, and then took the bow. <laughs> That's a nice one. <laughs> ah, you were born in 1956, you yes. said. That yes. was the time when I passed my MD examination <laughs> with distinction. Now you see the difference. <laughs> and <laughs> if I may say so. And that's not the only distinction. <laughs> and Mozart's bicentenary. Yes, yes and Mozart's bicentenary. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Now that you've uh, heard the background of how they got involved in this great music, I think it's time to ask each one of them what the great moments in their listening rather than their performances. You know, when I was studying in London, I was on a shoestring budget. That was a time when the Reserve Bank, uh, you know, allotted only a certain amount of money, which so that at the end of the month, the last week of the month, my nourishment was mainly on Cadbury chocolate, frankly. <laughs> so we couldn't get any money. There was no way, however much I wanted to see a big concert or an opera, that I could do so. So I'm afraid my... Uh, my memory of great music was only after I came back and after I managed to go abroad for various reasons that I could see things and hear things. Frankly, before I saw these things, I never liked opera. I just couldn't bear the opera. When some, my mother put on an opera record, I said, please, for God's sake, 
put it off. I can't bear this. But then a friend of mine said, you have to see an opera. I said, I'm not particularly clean. I said, I'm going to give you a ticket. Go and see it. And it was the first opera that I saw with Veera. Remarkably enough, we had our two small kids and didn't know where to keep them. So we had tickets for them also. And I was mightily afraid that they might say something in the middle, which they did at one point in time. Anyway, it was a magic flute by Mozart. And I was completely bored. I never imagined it. Why? Why? And I, I got to see almost all the operas that matter at some time or the other. I can't say which was the greatest. Aida, I remember, in New York, for example, which was superb. It was Zaffarelli who did it. I remember La Bohème, again, which was beautiful, again, produced beautifully, beautifully. And all of them, most of them, every one of them. But I used to wonder, when I used to say, what makes the opera great? Why does one like, so many people like the opera? And then I realized here, that it is just a slice of life. Mm. Everything about life. And you hear great music, great voices, and a small little story, which you can perhaps put in three or four lines, which is passionate, which has all the passions in it. And every time this passion comes in the story, it is magnified 20 times over by the singer. The music, the setting, the singing is literally thrown at the audience and hits him in the heart, perhaps uncensored by the brain. Otherwise, how would you expect it if I were to tell you that a person who is dying is singing at the top of his <laughs> voice? But you don't think about that at all. Is that you know which makes yeah, really that the doctor in you that didn't allow somebody with consumption to sing with such volume yes that's right that's right but so that's the whole thing you see there is nothing as great and as beautiful as a good a human well produced voice. voice that's true which is why we collect the old records mm -hmm. to see what the golden age of singing was and why a caruso record in 1902 is still a bestseller in its various forms. So that's how it is. I've seen almost all. I can't say which is the best. I love all of them, most of them, really. I love La Bohème. So simple and so beautiful. And the arias are so really beautiful. Don't you cry at the end? I do. I do. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. Yes. I love the other ones. I love uh, very many of Verdi's. I've seen all of them. I love the passionate one. I love Tosca, for example, of Puccini, you know. I love the Rigoletto, which is superb. Yes. I love Aida, which is superb again, superb, superb. And almost all of them, it's so difficult to say which is the better one and which is not the better one. Now we move from Italy to Germany to Mr. Nariman. He loves his Richard Strauss, his Wagner, and I think a little more than the Italians, or do you say equally? Mm, more, I'd, more. Say, I'd say equally. E there you are. Because but you listen a lot to Richard Strauss and Wagner. I do. But I've got my tale as well of the great concerts I've seen. Ah. Now, I was very fortunate that I was sent to Harvard to study law. And in that one year, I had this, uh, f this festival ticket which took me to about some uh, 10 concerts of the Boston Symphony. And I very often thanks to my pecuniary circumstances, had to walk and walk back. <laughs> but anyway, I saw a lot of Ozawa. I saw a couple of other great conductors come. I saw Ormandi, guest conduct as well. And I saw a very great number of players. I saw Sirkin and a number of other very great players. There is one concert in particular which stands out because I read about it many years after. It was the Mahler Fifth Symphony conducted by a guest orchestra, namely the London Symphony, under Abado at that time in 
and the symphony begins with a trumpet call. Pa 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 pam, pa 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 pam, pa 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 pam. The very first trumpet call was wrong. It hmm. went pa pa pam, pa 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 pam, ah. pa 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 pam. Abado did not stop the trumpet player because he knew had he done so, he wouldn't have been able to play hmm. at all because he knew that he had auditioned for the Boston Symphony that morning and had been turned down. Oh. Now this I got to know when I read it in Reader's Digest ah. years and years after. So this one particular concert stands out for that reason. Of course, I saw a lot of opera as well. Sarah Caldwell at that point of time was the yes. reigning conductor. And it was followed by a remarkable New York year. In New York, Fortunately, I lived at 82nd and Central Park West, which is about 15 or 20 minutes from the Lincoln Center. Now, the Lincoln Center had four great halls. It had an opera house, then it had the Met, which is the greatest of opera houses in the United States. And then it had the Avery, Avery Fisher. Fisher and the Alice Tully. Yeah. As a result of which, I was in concerts roughly four to five times a week. Ah which is remarkable. So I saw a huge amount of music. Zubin Mehta was at that point of time New the, the reigning conductor and I must have seen him n number of times. But the concert that stands out with him is a performance of Mahler's Second Symphony with Krista Ludwig. My grandmother was visiting and that was the only concert she was able to go to and it was the best. He does it. Out, it was absolutely outstanding. The resurrection. Uh, the resurrection. It was outstanding. His recording is also wonderful. Outstanding. Yeah. So that is something that that's a highlight that sticks out again. I saw n number of operas, and that was the great Levine era. So I saw yes. James Levine n number of times perform all the great Verdi's, the great Puccini's, the great Wagner. I saw four Wagner operas that year. Two of the Ring. I happened to see Das Rheingold and Siegfried. Now everybody says Siegfried is very boring. It's not boring at all. Not too. at all. Yeah. Sir Thomas Beecham said that Act 2 is something that one can do completely without. I disagree. <laughs> Strongly. It's one of the greatest operas written. And then of course, I, I happened also to see Parsifal, which is outstanding. Yeah. And uh, one or two others. So, the New York year was again fantastic. And then I used to make occasional forays abroad. What stands out is hearing the Vienna Philharmonic in its home, in the uh, music barrage. I went to a number of concerts. But one, again, what stands out there is the Sibelius First Symphony, which was conducted by Maris Janssens. Uh, and I recall that that symphony haunted me for three days after I heard it. It just didn't leave me. I was in a Zoroastrian heaven, Garo Deman, <laughs> actually, for three days. It just didn't leave. And there was the same thing with the Bruckner 7th, this Beautiful. time with Pierre Boulet yes. and the Vienna Philharmonic, but not in the music where I, in the concert house. I so. couldn't believe, I couldn't agree with you more about the Bruckner 7th. It yeah. was absolutely a it's fantastic, 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 yeah. fantastic. I think it's, it's considered the best of the, and, of the and, and do you know what Wagner said of Bruckner? Yeah. He said of Bruckner that I think He's the only one who measures close to Beethoven. Mm. That's what he said of Bruckner. Bruckner worshipped Wagner, yeah. which is why he said yeah. it. <laughs> Bruckner, yes, Bruckner really worshipped Wagner. Yeah. In fact, Bruckner actually took off on his musical Odyssey mm. after he met Wagner. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about Mahler's Fifth, isn't it? I think that's a great, great concerto. Great and concerto, I think yeah. the adagio of that, particularly uh, the slow half. movement, is one of the most beautiful yeah. moments. That you have two halves.
my favorite movement of all the Mahler symphonies is the last movement of the third. Ah, yes. The last movement of the third. Do you know that in that movement, he quotes, thus spake Zarathustra. He quotes Nietzsche, the man, the single, uh, a single individual who speaks or heart, partly speaks and partly sings the line is a quote from Das Vek Narsusra by Nietzsche when he says, Listen man, what does midnight's voice contend? I have slept my sleep. An awakening at dreaming's end. Deep is the world, deeper than they can contend. Deep is its woe, joy deeper than its heart's agony. Woe says, fade, go. But all joy wants is eternity. Always eternity. And he really says that, and I'm amazed, you know, it's it's the co complete quote from Das Spik Zarathustra Nietzsche. A single lone voice. Voice singing. like that, yes. It's half singing. It sounds so beautiful at the background of the music coming up. I think it's one of his one of his great composers. Though I do love his seventh and whatever has been done of his ninth, not complete. That also is a is a really great thing. It's our ambition to do that at the NCPA, we hope. Mm. But you know, we did a reduction of the seventh, which was made by the French artists who come here for 13 instruments. And I thought the Bruckner seventh with 13 instruments, it will be a travesty. It was not. And I think we'll send you the recordings to say how well it was arranged. And therefore, I think that one of the great things that happened to music in a way was that many of these works that were written during the times when emperors and princes and people could afford to pay whatever they wanted for these extravagant performances. I think both Mahler and Strauss had huge orchestras. Yes, because huge, they huge had the money too. But, but equally, it was all brought down. Kushru, what you just said is important because these composers needed patrons. That's right. Now you had the famous Ludwig II as patron of Wagner. Of course. And if you go through the Opus 1 to 138 of Beethoven, yes, you will see that most of them are dedicated to some patron Always. or the other. Always. Prince Lichkowski, for example. Lichkowski, correct. You yes. follow? And Prince Lobovsky. Yeah, that's Lobkowski, for example. Lobkowitz. Lobkowitz. Also. You and had Empress Maria Theresa, the septet, for example. Dedicated directly to a sovereign. You had Emperor uh, Frederick William II, Frederick William III, the early Opus 5 cello sonatas, ninth oh, symphony. Yes. So you had dedications, you even had a dedication to Emperor Alexander of Russia, Opus 30, violin sonata. So you had dedications to these heads of state of and the lesser counts, princes. And Haydn, of course, for the emperors of yeah. Austria. Yeah. They had to write us. A quartet almost every fortnight. Right. Yeah. But the yeah. thing is, you know, there were the they, they were great sponsors, you know, for great music. Yes. And that's the I think a fortunate thing which happened first to Beethoven. He was the first man, I think, of the first composer who was a freelancer and who was very popular in Vienna and uh, who could support himself and much more than support himself because of the sponsorship of great people yes. and very rich and people. And these people also basked in the honor, you know, that Beethoven gave them with his great music, dedicating it to them. You see, they thought that it was a great thing. At one point in 1808, he was going to accept an offer from King Jerome of Westphalia, Napoleon's youngest brother, to go there because he was being offered something much more than what he'd earned in Vienna. So three counts got together and offered him an annuity of 8,000, whatever their currency was at that point. Hmm. And the Archduke Rudolf did it till the end of his life. That's right. Kinski defaulted. And Lopkowitz also after a point defaulted. 
You but know, they were great. So I, and yeah. I, I was just wondering what would have happened to Mozart if he had sponsors like yeah. that. You know, yeah. the poor man, you know, genius and is a great genius, musical genius, had no one to support him. Yeah. And he was on his own and he was in penury and in poverty. And in spite of in spite of the fact that he was such a great genius, yeah. such a great and musical Schubert. genius. And Schubert, yes. And Schubert. Also. But you're not talking about great patrons. There is a lady called Charlotte Rothschild from the famous family yeah. who came and sang for us. She was a well-trained soprano, but she did an unusual program. Apparently, the Rothschild house was open to all great musicians who had time to recover from mental illnesses or poverty. And they had a book. It was called the Grand Livre, the great book. And each one of those composers wrote a song with the thing that it should be only performed by the family and then signed their name and spent a few days as guests of the Rothschilds. So Charlotte Rothschild, who was entitled to sing, she did an entire program. Songs by Chopin, Schumann, Wagner, Liszt. All these people came to their house. And these are unique. And this is what she performed, the NCPA. And it is good to hear that they never went away empty-handed. And that he always gave them a little packet to survive the next few months. So there were even great patrons right up to the 20th century. Yes, I think uh, it would be nice at least to comment on one of the great, great uh, composers in the Romantic era, as they call it. And I particularly am enamored with Beethoven. He was fortunate, you know, that he had so many great patrons to uh, allow him to freelance and compose music. But some of his music is indeed fantastic. Take, you were talking of Wagner, for example, the Eroica, according to a great musical critic, is compared with one of Wagner's great is Tristan and Isolde, saying that it was a landmark in the evolution of Western music because of the great way in which the harmony is carried to its extreme extent. And personally, I feel that the fifth, his symphony, the fifth, is indeed fantastic. Uh, it starts, I don't think there's any other piece of music which starts with the notes that he stayed. And the beauty of Beethoven, I think, is that from the basic elements of music, he could compose music with such complexity. Like da 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 da, starts the fifth symphony. And then a tone below, da 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 da. And he takes that as his theme and it comes again and again and again with relentless fury taking, carrying everything in front of it to the end. And it's interesting that da 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 didn't come at that time. The da 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 theme was, was given much later right. as the knock on fate. Fate knocking at the okay. door yeah. came on much later. And it's not that da 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 came spontaneously. He had many, many sort of different mm -hmm. contributions to those notes till he struck onto that note yeah. again. So that's the other other amazing thing. And it was supposed to be re really the the song of the yellow hammer, the bird, yes. which his pupil Zerni said that that is how you yeah. know he got this particular thing. Mm -hmm. And it's really a symphony of conflict in a symphony of triumph, but it is not a symphony of conflict and triumph in the usual sense of the word. It's its own conflict, his inner conflict, which is so sad, really. Imagine a man who is deaf composing, and he was close to deafness, at this complete deafness at this point in time. You wonder, is it that he... Is it that he saw sounds, as some psychedelics say they mm. do? They hear colors and they see sounds. It's amazing. The conflict between his deafness and perhaps the tonal images within his mind, that is the conflict. The conflict between his deafness and the fact that he had to contend with the outside world and his inside world as well. And ultimately, you know, you feel that he is acquiesces to the fate that has been thrust upon.
the fallopian right the sounds of nature in the pastoral symphony when he couldn't hear yeah. those were sounds that he imagined and which were so close to nature but the thing is you know that you can imagine tonal sounds within your mind and the conflict that he can't hear them but he has to imagine them i can't just believe you know that you know a person who is deaf could have written the ninth symphony could have written the emperor concerto the misa solem the misa solem is you know there is a difference here you know between beethoven and mozart both were geniuses but mozart was a remarkable genius in the sense it almost seemed that the music was already there in mm. his mind and he just had to put it down just poured out just poured out of him he used to compose so many things in between rehearsals while playing the lyrics yes so many things and the only time that a friend of his saw him really really sort of serious was at a luncheon where he wouldn't speak and he would fold his napkin back and forth and back and forth for about half an hour and said please excuse me and wrote something out somewhere so that's a sort of a, whereas beethoven had to work hard yeah. yes he had to sweat as this is genius is 90% hard work and 10% inspiration that was beethoven so you saw the corrections in his yes, score compared yes. to mozart you, yeah. you follow and and he had to work hard yeah. for the emperor concerto he had to work very 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 hard and that was again another great piece of music and the thing was you know he was a pianist he was a virtuoso pianist of course a fantastic pianist therefore some of his greatest works you know were written for the piano if you ask me and his symphonies of course you were talking of the ninth symphony but i think the third the yeah. fifth and the ninth are my favorite the ninth because of and it's again remarkable how they were how these musicians were influenced by people around them goethe for example schiller for example they were influencing music they were influencing art as well I think Litz was the fellow who wrote on the, uh, a symphony on the, for, called the Fourth Faust Symphony. Faust, yes. That's Faust, Faust and Dante. Both. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. Faust and Dante, isn't it? And Schiller, of course, the old great old piece. Of course, the ending of the first movement of the Eroica hmm. is a masterpiece. Absolutely, of that's what I said. Kusru, the beginning of the Eroica is yeah. what marks the new symphonic Era. movement because yes. you always had an introduction in Haydn. Here you have two notes. Bam, bam. Tan 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 tan. and also if you take the violin concerto yeah. which violin concerto have you have you ever heard which has starts with a drum beat yes correct dum 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 which one correct. which concerto which music correct. for that matter ever starts with a drum beat, drum beat. You. when you go to the great ra huh? inevitably you are asked is it bach is it mozart is it, is it beethoven i would answer all three very difficult to very choose difficult. very difficult but there was a committee set up in boston because you have a little heart in symphony hall with the words l van beethoven written there the committee was asked to deliberate and the committee picked up beethoven as the greatest i would also think so really i think he was and particularly when you see the disadvantage he had that's the other see, thing see that's one that's one part yeah. the other part is that he spanned three centuries he begins like haydn he gets into his own now you have you spoken of the eroica You have Eroica as Opus 55, followed by the Triple Concerto as 56, followed by the Appassionata as 57, the Great Fourth G Major Concerto, yeah. Piano Concerto, Opus 58, 59 the Razumovsky Quartets, and then 60 and 61 Fourth Symphony and Violin and Concerto, Concerto, all in one line. Oh, that's terrific. And period. that was his middle period. Then you come to what I may call the 20th century period. 
the late quartets. Yes, the late quartets are fantastic. And they were far, far in advanced yeah. musically. So he spent three whatever. centuries. How can I ask you a controversial question? Yeah. Any survey that is made at present as to who the greatest composer was, inevitably everybody turns to Bach. Hmm. That he was here and the rest were yes. somewhere there. Every single survey, critics, etc., yes. etc. In modern times, yes. Now, there's a book called The Composer's Eleven, written by Neville Cardus, the great cricket Cricketer. and, mu and mu music, music yeah. critic, hmm. in which he says, you know, yes, Schubert was full of melodies, full of melodies. And every time he came to writing something which was more technical as he wanted to be, yet another melody would intrude and he would finally end up with a plethora of melodies. Unlike Bach, who would write a perfect fugue, who could write a perfect counterpoint, and when he came to melodies, he floundered. What if Schubert had the expertise of Bach, and Bach had, had, the, had also, the melodic yeah. thing? That's a nice that way. might have been a greatest that's, that's, composer. That, that's but a nice. that's a and 19... That is when Beethoven had both. Beethoven had, had both. Fabulous melody an, and tremendous development. We and all agree Even the violin concerto, absolutely. it is an absolute beauty. It's a work of genius. It's an yeah. absolute genius. beauty. Crystal clear, classical in the true sense of the word. Yeah. And the runs like a brook running. And the ending brilliant. of the second movement, you know. And the second movement is, again. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, so, we can go on forever like this. But what we would like to see is how it has affected you professionally. How you feel that the understanding of this great music has also helped you in helping your patients think or your clients? In my professional life, it has been a great boon to me. Uh, as I said, when I was very young and very stressed, looking after very ill people, lying awake at night, I would listen to music. I would listen particularly to Bach at that point in time. And I would listen to many, many, many pieces of Bach, not the Brandenburg concertos. I would like some of his partitas. I would listen to the Chacon, for example, in the middle of the night. It's one of the most greatest pieces, perhaps one of the, the greatest work on the violin that I have come across is the Chacon, the unaccompanied Chacon. And it is very useful to introduce patients to Bach and to music as well. Music, somehow or the other, a different kind of music, mind you, calms the patient. It's, I've seen it reduce the pulse rate, reduces the blood pressure. Music listened to before a patient goes on to surgery is known to keep the pulse down, keep the blood pressure down. During surgery, the surgeon listens to it unconsciously, subconsciously, at the back of his mind. It seems to calm. I've known surgeons sometimes put out the scalpel, put down the forceps, wait for a moment, listen and start again. So it's great, really. And uh, I have found it useful, really, therapeutically. It reduces the need for analgesics, reduces the need for painkillers when you listen to music. Mm. It's useful for patients who are convalescing after surgery. I've used it in the wards also for patients who have been chronically ill for a long time. And as an outpatient, I've recommended certain pieces of music, particularly those who are anxious and stressed. Perhaps the one which I found most useful is Mozart's clarinet concerto. It is beautiful, really beautiful. The timber, the richness and the velvety sound and the absolute genius of this composition. The first time I used this was a young girl who came to me saying that, Doctor, I haven't slept for the last four weeks and if you don't do something, I'm going to jump out of the window. And I noticed that she had received all the sedatives, all the tranquilizers, all that was done. And I said, will you listen to this Western class piece of Western classical music? She said, no, I don't like Western classical music. I like pop music. I said, please listen to this. I asked her to listen to this clarinet concerto. She comes back to me after two weeks and says, Doctor, this is miraculous. Yes. I've started to sleep again. Well, look. I've used this particular piece <laughs> of music and at least a hundred people. At least a hundred people. Not one of them has said that it has not benefited them in some way or the other. So I have a feeling that it is the thing to use. 
I've also asked them, for those who know music, the adagio of uh, Mozart's G major concerto, which is also very beautiful, or the second movement of uh, Beethoven's violin concerto, which is also very yeah. beautiful, or the uh, or the adagio of Mahler's fifth, which is also very beautiful. So, and also some of Chopin, nocturnes of Chopin, for example, which are also very beautiful. So these have all been very useful, but. You know, all this was hearsay at once upon a time. Now it bears the stamp of science. Because it has been shown conclusively how does it act? What does it do? It is believed, and again here the work somehow or the other has been done chiefly on Mozart. The chap called Dr. Conrad is a surgeon. He says that in his opinion, it works, it does all this by working on the neuroendocrine system. And he said that a person who is critically ill and who hears this has a sudden burst of the growth hormone from the pituitary. And that is important for healing. Mm. And the neuroendocrine apparatus is that which controls the immune system of the body, conducts, channels the immune system of the body. And perhaps it is through this that Mozart's music really act. So there is a scientific basis Very really now interesting. That, is, that is coming. And he as a surgeon said that when I don't, haven't played music on the day that I'm operating, my fingers are not as good as they otherwise would be. The feedback I get from the tissues that I handle is not half as good as when I have played the piano and then started to operate. So it's very important both for my person, my person, the de-stressing that I can get by listening to music and also helping likewise yeah. patients, you know, who Very have problems. Important. Doc, yeah. have you heard of experiments conducted on plants? Yes, of course. Yeah. Of course. And apparently, if you play Mozart, yes. the plant grows towards the music. If you play rock music, it goes away. <laughs> no, but the great experiments were done by that Bengali gentleman, Bose. Yeah. Who Obviously. showed that plants have life yeah, and exactly. plants have emotions. So that when you are angry, the plant behaves differently. And when you are gentle and nice and soft and as he says, plays good music. He said, Mozart, good music, they literally grow better and grow towards you. He, he was a fantastic man. Oh, he was the Amar first goes. man who showed really I, that plants have life. life. This is how it is. Amar I goes. happen to know that a baby in the womb rea reacts to music. Now my Nina. My older daughter was, I think, seven months in Sanaya's womb. And we went to a concert at the Homi Baba Theatre. Nina started kicking the moment the music started and stopped kicking the moment it stopped. No, but I'll tell you what, the professor in California yeah. has worked on this. Yeah. And he says very much what you said just now, that the fetus, a grown fetus, not a, a grown fetus, you know, appreciates the music that is played outside. And he goes even further to say that when it is born, the newborn baby recognizes that particular mode. <laughs> yeah, why should I it? Lord knows if, whether if that's true or not. That's a born genius. It is, that's it, what is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is said, this, see, is, this yeah. is the professor who's actually working on this. Yeah. He's working on this. There is another actually. interesting relationship with music. Don Bradman, arguably the greatest batsman ever, said that before he went out to bat, his room was shut and he used to listen to Beethoven. Yes. I amazing. Huh? Amazing. That's amazing. Really. But it is, there's no doubt it is the greatest stress buster. Yes. So much better that you hear Beethoven than that you smoke or that you drink. Of course. It's obvious. So, it's so the basically, therefore, therefore, art is so important, isn't it? Art, music is so very important. Which Don't is so? unfortunate that it's not recognized as such. Except in many, many countries where music is God, places like Germany and Italy and of course a lot. But here in India, of course, our Indian music is wonderful. It is extremely variegated, different gharanas. From and the that's Nars, the reason South. why you don't find great uh, in Indians producing great, playing great Western music. That's one reason, Which because is, Indian music itself is so great. That's it's what so Zubin Mehta's view yeah. yes. is. It is, ob it's obvious. Mind it you. is quite obvious. It but is quite I would argue a little bit to the contrary to say that Western classical music is in every continent, every city 
and even it South is universal. Africa. Yes, it taps it's, the it's universal, universal part. Universal. Of it. Yeah. it is Whereas universal. Whereas here, I think we downplay it a little bit, and it needs a little encouragement. And that's why the, that's way. why you, the the organization that you are heading just now is so extremely important. We are trying to make a yes, difference. Yes, yes. yes. you so made important. a huge difference to the and, cultural and life. And of it's no, fantastic. The, the point is that. There was a wonderful speech made by the culture minister of Britain. Why culture matters and how important it is. It reflects the personality of a country. It tells on the values that are, uh, the citizens have. And the induction of culture into the minds of the citizens is what will make civilization. And there can be no culture without art. Absolutely. It, isn't it? Absolutely. Art is at the very, very heart of a culture, of a, isn't it? Right. Absolutely. Also, art is emotive, don't you think so? It's so yeah. emotive. Yeah. And what is man except intellect and, and emotion. emotion? And it is all intellect today, these days. But emotion is so important. Feeling, for example, is so important. Like music, for example, stems more from feeling and emotion than from the intellect. And I think if you hear great music, you said Wagner, I think say Mahler or perhaps Beethoven. Sometimes when you're feeling that and you're alone, you forget the outside world. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. You delve deep within yourself, absolutely. within your own psyche. And somehow you renew yourself. That's right. And renewing yourself again and again like that makes you for some reason or the other a better human being. So I think it's so important. As a matter of fact, our constitution in Article 29, it's perhaps the only article of its kind in the world, specifically says any section of the citizens of India, their cultural rights are preserved. And the word cultural is used in its widest sense. Why the sense is important, yeah. yes. And I can't thank uh, the NCPA and Kushro. You are really leading the way in the importance, I'm in stressing the importance of music to the people in our country. Well, I, all I can do is to thank you two gentlemen for having taken your time off. And we are honored greatly. And we hope that noble aims come to fruition with whatever little we can do at the NCPA. Anyway, I hope we can have more of these conversations. And again, God bless all of you for having supported great art. Thank you. Thank you.